uh, throughout the webinar. If you have any questions, you're able to submit them uh, straight through the WebEx uh, chat box, and we'll be able to answer those toward the end of the webinar. Uh, or if, of course, something is very relevant throughout, we can uh, pepper Laz uh, with those questions intermittently uh, through the chat. Uh, very excited to have Laz because of his experience, and, and I've done several events uh, with Laz most recently in, in London uh, for a Serious Decisions Roundtable. And just to see the feedback that people give after Laz speaks and, and the amount of respect that he garners within the channel is, is amazing. Uh, and when you look at his background and why we asked Laz to join us today, I think it's pretty obvious uh, that he brings an extensive level of, of experience and detailed knowledge uh, to the table. Uh, he had headed up North American channels for a company called Unipress Software, uh, which was later acquired by BMC. Uh, he was EVP of Sales and Marketing at Beast Financials, um, which was a provider of high-speed trading platforms before people probably even knew what they were. Uh, and he was also VP of Alliances and OEM programs at Viewpoint. So. Laz comes from the perspective both of, you know, being in sales, you know, as a more junior person out of college. Uh, he, of course, has a, a tremendous marketing background uh, on a global level as well as in North America. Uh, and even so, more on top of that with the alliances and the OEM uh, experience, which I think brings an incredible amount of knowledge um, and data to the table. Uh, beyond all that, uh, Laz began his career, probably one of the best training grounds that exists with IBM uh, under the Lotus name at the time. Uh, and he also uh, is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy and Rutgers University. Um, and at, in his current role, Laz is the Group Service Director for Channel Management Strategies uh, at Sears Decisions, of course, very well-respected consulting company um, focusing on sales, marketing, and product, and how to unify them all. So, Laz, again, after the long intro, thank you again for joining us today. Oh, my God. It sounds like uh, you're talking about somebody else there, Michael. <laughs> Well, I'm impressed every time I read your bio. I got to practice it before I introduce <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, listen. More importantly, I, I'm I'm grateful to uh, be able to address all the folks that uh, took some time out today to hear about some best practices in in the channel. So why don't we get started? Absolutely. You got it. All right. Um, so today's talk is really about channel marketing. But when we were thinking about the message we wanted to deliver, one of the most important things that we, we focused on was what does it mean to the buyer, right? So, so Mike, if we go to the first slide, let's, let's just put up the, the title there so everyone has a good idea of, uh, of what this is. We're really going to think about how channel marketing needs to adapt to really drive effectiveness in what some companies are calling partner-led programs. Now, partner-led programs have different meanings for different companies, and we're going to get into that in a second. But before we go any further, let's take a closer look at the agenda. Now, the key here will be that we want to focus on how B2B buyers are changing. Uh, you know, there's a new sales dynamic out there, and uh, as, uh, as Mike mentioned, you know, uh, I'm, I'm one of you guys. I was out there selling and marketing in the channel for a very long time. And I remember when it used to be all about raiding the literature closet and getting as much information in my hands as possible to take them out to customers or share them with partners. But the truth is that that no longer fits the bill. There's a lot more going on there, and there's a lot more information that the customer has access to, which really changes the sales dynamic, and we're going to look at that closely. More importantly, we'd like to really start thinking about the role of the web and understanding the different buyer types because you really can't treat everybody as one size fits all. And lastly, uh, we're going to kind of team up here, and I'm going to share with you some data. And Structured Web has agreed to share some insightful case studies around the data so that they can show you what are the most effective tactics and programs to use at each one of the stages of that buyer's journey. So why don't we start with a discussion around how those B2B buyers are changing, Michael. And uh, I think it's sobering to look at uh, some stats here. And, and the first thing that I wanted to, to share is how we see things changing over the, the next five years. And, and really right now, what we do is we collect a lot of um, you know, fact-based intelligence, and we use this intelligence to advise our clients on what are the best practices. And one of the things that we've noticed is that 67% of the buyer's journey is digital. Search, web exploration is typically the first course of action that companies are looking at. And the implication of this is 
that social selling, inbound marketing, and persona-based marketing will be a critical strategy to reach the elusive buyer. And that means that you've got to be proficient at these tactics. And if you're not, you may not get invited into the selling process. Um, but why is this happening? Let's take a step back. You know, in the past, it used to be that sales was really in control. And as I mentioned, I was one of those guys who'd load up the trunk of his car with all the sales literature back in the IBM days and, you know, take that out to customers. And the buyer, on the other hand, you know, they had a, a lot, lot less options that, uh, that, that they had at their disposal. So if we click again, you'll see the, the buyer and you'll see that they really had to rely on the seller for information. So without that seller providing the data, there was little they can do. Let's fast forward to what's happening now. When we look at what processes those buyers are following, they really have taken control of the wheel. They're far more knowledgeable, they're more demanding with their requests, and the sellers are now reliant on marketing to engage with those buyers. In fact, sales is realized that the sales cycle and the buying cycle are decoupled. They're not driving the process. The process is being driven by the customer because those buyers now have multiple sources of information. And this isn't anecdotal. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that we're sharing with you some information about our persona research. And we conducted this buyer survey um, a few years ago, and we just refreshed it this year for our um, 2015 summit. And we started rating where is it that the uh, buyer, in this case the CXO, the VP, and the director level person, is going to get their information. And you can see that most of it starts in the beginning with search on the Internet. So if you click one more, you'll see the, uh, the focus on that 25, 23, and 24 percent. Right, And that means that that's a large part of that initial stage. And guess what? Sellers are not involved there. Right, It's consumption of content, and delivering the right content at this point is critical. Later on, you'll see that when they start validating the information, they'll have access to a social media community. Now, if you were like me, we used to wait for trade shows or conferences or whatever the case be so that you can reach out to your colleagues in different companies and get their take. But today, that's happening socially. So again, social media becomes a really important part. Now, if we look at where B2B leads are originating, you'll notice that over the last five or six years, it's becoming steadily, increasingly important to be on the web. And this should be no news to anyone, but what is news is the number or the magnitude of what is happening here. We're going from 55% web to 71% web. And we expect that, you know, it's not going to be totally excluded from from uh, face to face interaction, but this is becoming more and more important. So in other words, if you're not working marketing on the web, if you're relying specifically on events, um, you're in trouble. You're in trouble because you've got to react quickly to this. Now, inbound and social become really important. And what it means is that we have to be able to tell the tactics apart. Today, 37 to 50 percent of the program spend is on digital, and it's mostly designed for inbound marketing. This is going to increase to maybe even become three quarters of this, so 50 to 65 percent in the next five years. That's going to be that um, um, platforms like the mobile device are going to be the first screen that that buyer sees when they're searching for information. What does this mean for marketing? Social media, digital marketing, and mobile marketing are going to be really critical competencies. Let's pull up the buyer's journey for a second, and let's talk about what's happening during that process. Now, as you guys can see, I'm sharing with you what we call the buyer's journey. And Serious Decisions is known for uh, a few models, uh, and no pun intended there, we're known for a lot of models. But frankly, when we look at that buyer's journey, we break it up into these uh, six stages. You have that early consideration, or what we call loosening the status quo, committing to change, then exploring possible solutions and committing to one of those solutions, and then trying to validate the purchase, either creating an ROI scenario or really focusing on the vendor to select and validate. 
Well, if you ask the buyer and you look at some of that data that we just shared with you, what's happening in those early stages? So we'll see that in the early stage, search is really important. Access to peers, internal discussions, really a lot of content-based marketing. Then in the second stage, you'll see that the buyer actions, once they've collected the information that they do, that's when they call sales into the picture. Well, guess what? If you're not participating in some of that inbound marketing in the early stages, you're not even getting invited into the selling process, as I mentioned before. So really, inbound and social become critical competencies. And it doesn't stop there. We'll see that further on, as they're doing the ROI and the vendor selection a little bit further on the process, you'll see that at that point, there are other tactics involved. But before the sales process begins, we have to focus on getting that consideration. And that's really where all that influence comes into play. So if you start thinking about that influence, you start to understand where do buyers obtain the information so that they can have the conversation. Now, most partners really can't tell the difference between a lot of the tactics that we have here. But what we need to do as channel marketers is really show them where they can fit their content into the multitude of outlets that are available to them. So, Mike, if you hit it one more time, we'll see the um, – We'll see the different types of tactics, so whether it's tweets, whether it's blogs, whether it's white papers, it really becomes which tactic at which stage in which outlet. Now, here's the one thing I want you guys to remember is that you can't just leave it up to the partner. In fact, if we move to the next level, notice that uh, the partner really is in a hurry to get as much information as possible. How many of you can remember going to try and access some content, and then before you know it, you've got a long-winded form that's asking for 20 pieces of information, and you kind of just throw your hands up in the air and you say, never mind, right? You know, it's funny how this happens because, um, you know, the example that I use is typically if I met you at a cocktail party, right, and, uh, you know, a professional gathering where, you know, maybe we're before a conference or something like that, and uh, we'll use Mike as the example. And I know Mike, uh, but I don't know Mike, uh, you know, intimately. But if I met Mike at that conference and I would say, you know, Mike, um, what's your name? Uh, how long have you been doing this? Uh, you know, where do you live? What city? Mike's probably, you know, going to answer those questions. But then if I start asking him, Mike, are you married? Do you have kids? What are your kids' names? Well, now he might answer them. Maybe he won't. If I start asking what school they go to, what time do they show up for lunch, et cetera, et cetera, Mike's going to think I'm a real creep here, and he's not going to answer any of the questions I'm giving him. So what makes us think that we can ask all those types of questions, not as personal as the example, mine was a little bit more extreme, but what makes us think that we can bombard our prospects with all that information, all those questions at once? It just doesn't work that way. So a big thinking here is to start thinking about taking a staged, multi-step approach, aligned to the buyer's journey. And I know some of you are thinking, hey, we do that already, but the truth of the matter is a lot of the partners don't. A lot of the partners just like to do one-and-done efforts, and they'll sign up, they'll use your tactics, they'll execute, and then, you know, they'll move on to the next supplier or they'll move on to the next marketing program. So, Mike, let's show them a, an example of what we're talking about here in terms of a multi-step program. So, multi-step means that it could be that they're finding you on the website, maybe through search, and you guide them either from the website or what we call watering holes. So, another place where we can get this is by starting to market at places where the buyer goes to get the information. So in these watering holes, we might see somebody and have a conversation with them, whether it's a social media blog or something else. So in the next step, we want to expand that conversation and say, hey, you know what, I've got something to say here, but let's take it off. Let's I'll share with you a link to a conversation we're having on a LinkedIn group, for example, and take them there to have that conversation. Now, once we've got them there, then we can make them an offer. But we're not going to make them an offer that's not valuable. So we might say, hey, notice that you're interested in this subject. Here's something more you can learn about regarding that subject. And then the buyer is likely to say, hey, that may be interesting. Now, remember, this could happen from the watering hole or it can happen from the website. In the next step, we can continue working with the buyer. And maybe after a couple of days, 
we might make them another offer. It might be a challenge or it might be, hey, come and take a look at a webcast that we've developed around this subject which you have seen to show them some interest in. Well, when that happens and you've got this buyer now following you from the social media blog to the learning offer to that, to that third touch now or the second touch as we have it here, um, that's when you can actually call this thing a lead. Up until then, it's just a hand raiser. Right, But what do most companies do? Most companies will get the person to fill out the form, they'll call it a lead, they'll send it to the partner, and you know what the partner's reaction is. I know two types of leads you're sending me, garbage that I know about and garbage that I don't know about. So guess what? I'm going to stop paying attention. This multi-step approach allows us to score these leads. It allows us to look at how interested the buyer is with us. And then in the final stage, we can continue making them offers or actually recycle some of those leads because maybe the decision process kind of stalls as they start validating. But we don't want to disappear. We want to be able to, you know, stay present in mind, maybe get into some advanced nurturing here and really work with that buyer along their journey, which could take months. Right? So again, the important thing here is to take this staged approach, and what we're going to share with you now is really how to react to these new B2B changes with the buyer. Okay? Now I've got three simple pieces of advice here, right? The first one is start thinking about leveraging the role of the web, right? Really get a good understanding of the role of the web and leverage it and let your partners know what's going on here. The second thing is try to learn as much as you can about the buyer and the journey they make when they're purchasing your product. And then the third thing is, let's not kid ourselves. Corporate marketing can worry about branding and awareness. Channel marketing has got to contribute to pipeline. So let's target our marketing on pipeline building activities that are measurable. And let's start with the first one, really understanding the role of the web. So we can advance a couple of slides here because really what we want to know is how buyers interact with those suppliers. And if you take that buyer's journey that I shared with you before, starting with the early consider and so on, what then becomes important is understanding that in the early stages through that education and even when they're doing the side-by-side -side comparisons, the web is going to play a really important role. Now, when they start justifying the decision, they start getting into the vendor and the, the nuts and bolts, and they really want to speak to someone, sales steps into the picture. It doesn't mean that the digital marketing goes away, and it's really important for us to know that. But know that in that early stage, the most important thing you can do is become visible, espouse some thought leadership, gain some influence so that you build credibility, and then you can move into that vendor selection phase. The second thing that's really important is no two buyers are the same. So when we say let's understand the buyer and the journey they take when they're purchasing, we really have to define who the buyer is. And this is where persona marketing comes into play. And if we start looking at persona marketing, the important thing to know here is to understand or gain better insights on the different buyer roles. So if you think about it, there's going to be different individuals in the organization. For one, they're going to be champions. These are going to be the sponsors. Next, you'll see different types, like the influencer. These are going to be internal or external trusted resources. You've got the decision makers, and those are going to be executives who are generally involved either very early in the process or very late in the process. And it's really important that you know who they are and when they're coming in and out of this buying process. Then you've got the users and the ratifiers. Now, the users, they'll always be the ones that are directly interacting with you, learning about the solution, but they may not be the decision makers. And, you know, I remember when I was working with partners, some of them were so starved for content that no matter what we gave them, they'd set up a meeting and send it over to the buyer as quick as possible. You know, if you send the ROI decision to someone from with a technical persona, chances are that's going to sit by the wayside, and it may never even make it to the executive sponsor. Again, it really varies by organization, but what we're saying here is be very calculated. And not only be calculated on who these people are, but also try to understand what makes them tick. So the next thing you want to do is you want to understand what are their wins. So, for example, the champion will want to know 
does the solution meet our needs? So it's going to be around business value. Because think about it. They're not going to put their neck on the line and sponsor a solution unless they know that it aligns to the business. The influencers, they're going to be much more keen on the performance and the scalability and reliability of the solution. CXOs, they're all about bottom line. These are the decision makers. They want to know ROI. So we need to make sure that we have content covers this. The users, you know, these folks are going to be asked to use the solution, and the question will be what will help them make their job better. And that's all about customer experience. So overlooking the user could be really in, could be a, a very huge mistake. And then finally, there is the total cost of ownership, which is sometimes, you know, some of you struggle with maybe you have a higher price point uh, product versus a low-end competitor, and you might say, hey, we never get, a, we never get uh, invited here because, you know, customers are so price sensitive. Well, the truth of the matter is they're always going to be price sensitive. But if you can show them over time what the total cost of ownership is going to be for that solution, like I've experienced in my past, you can almost say, hey, look, you know, it might be easier to get into a solution like this, but over a three-year period, it's going to cost you a lot more. And that's really what we're asking you to do is understand what makes these guys tick. And then when you've got an idea of who they are and what are the wins, you have to start thinking about how they behave in those different stages of that buyer's journey. So we did a little bit of uh, data searching here, and we got some information on how buyers rank their early stage actions. And in the early process, buyers really rely on the web to educate themselves and form opinions. They say that Internet search is the number one thing that they do when they're looking for a solution. So, for example, if you're selling a help desk software to a pharmaceutical industry, you will see someone in that industry literally go to Google and say, help desk solutions for pharmaceutical companies. And that's where they start filling out that search. The next thing they know is they start doing some website exploring. How many of you have optimized websites to be able to capitalize on this? Now, this doesn't mean that it's all digital, because the third thing that they actually ranked back was that they then asked the team or colleagues to come back with a series of options. So there are going to be a mix of online and offline type activities going on throughout. Once they really start nailing this down, then they start socializing the alternatives. And that's where you see them explore an online community like LinkedIn and throw out some ideas and see what other people have to say about this. So they'll go to those websites as ranked as number five. They'll look at some of this association marketing. And then they'll reach out to vertical or industry blogs and really start getting a better understanding of all of this. Once you have a feel, for what this content looks like and how they're using it, that means that now you can create a framework for delivering the content to the different buyers. And that's exactly what we're going to do next. What we want to do is lay out that buying cycle with the different stages. So we'll lay out the stages for you so we can see them again, the early consideration taking place during that education phase. We then move into some of the validation and the committing to change. So we get into the solution phase, and then we just let's build the whole thing out so we can see the entire framework. And then what we want to do is say, okay, who are the different personas that are coming in and out of these different stages? So I might say, I got decision makers and champions in those early stages, and I need to now look at what content resonates with these folks. And that may be different than the content that I use in the middle and in the late stages. So, for example, in that early stage, it's going to be awareness programs. It's going to be industry reports. It's going to be customer referrals. Think about that. What a customer doesn't want to do is take a chance on an unproven solution. So what are they going to do? They're going to look for another customer who's taken a chance on that solution and has succeeded. So anything that has to do with customer case studies, referrals in that early stage is going to be a winning formula. Later on, when they're moving into that solution stage, they want to know what other people have to say about this solution in terms of analysts, some competitive data, and here's where all that deep sales enablement takes place. When they get to the final stage, now in the vendor selection stage, they may have already made up their mind. And what we want to know there is how do we help them justify the decision? 
How do we create total cost of ownership, return on investment models that we can share with them so that when they get in front of their management to propose a solution, they've got all the ammo they need to make a decision. So again, these are the keys to understanding the buyer's journey. Now, I mentioned before that the other thing that we need to really focus on is building pipeline. Now, I doubt there's anyone on the line that isn't concerned about this. In fact, if you ask the partner what are the number one considerations that they want in marketing, it's going to be we want leads, right? And the keys to getting these leads are not going to be very simple. In fact, when we look at it, we have to start thinking about what does it take for both the supplier and the partner to generate leads. Now, some people have a problem with the term partner-led marketing versus supplier-led marketing. But I kind of say this kind of sits on a scale. On the one hand, you've got the partner, and if we go to the next slide, Mike will show the, the, the skills and the gaps. We've got the partner, and they're local experts, right? They've got that last mile. They can communicate an end-to-end -end solution to the customer. But what's wrong with that picture? They generally lack the marketing resources. They lack the automation. And you can't expect them to log into your Eloqua or, you know, your Marketo system, whatever it is, to use the marketing tools that you have. On the other hand, you've got the supplier. And they really have a machine. They've got the alignment. They've got the assembly. They've got the marketing services. They have content development. And they've got the marketing automation. But the one thing they can't do by themselves is execute alone in a scalable manner. So whether they like it or not, they're going to have to reach out to that partner and bring them into the fold and let them execute. And that's really the tough part here. And the tough part is gaining that adoption and that engagement. Now, what tactics work best? So the ingredients are going to be really focused on the different types of tactics that are at our disposal. So, again, Mike is sharing with you some of the key points, but social selling is going to be important. Multi-touch programs like we just shared with you are going to be important. All digital marketing that we can do in those early stages, the focus on thought leadership, and also sales readiness. Let's make sure that sales is enabled to execute, right? We can't expect them to execute on their own. So, having said that, what we want to do is we want to show you what the most effective tactics are in the early, middle, and late stages. And then what I said before is Structured Web has agreed to do a deep dive in each one of these to provide us some fantastic examples of how this works, OK? So let's start with the early stage. And if we look at that early stage, here start seeing that white papers, peer referrals, and webinars are great hooks to get that new buyer in. Why? Because you're sharing knowledge. You're sharing content that's valuable to them. And as that buyer is starting to look at this, we want to make sure that we can espouse them with the information that they need. So we want to make sure that we've got those partners playing the role of thought leader by syndicating the content or sharing that information with them. And one great way that I've seen companies do this, in fact, Structured Web does a great job here, is on social syndication. So what I've asked Mike to do is, you know, gear up some examples where we can show this social syndication at work. So, Mike, why don't you share with us a little bit about what we're talking about here? Absolutely. Thanks, Les. So, without, uh, of course, going into too much detail that, that exposes anything on behalf of specific customers, we wanted to at least share a framework uh, of how we try to help our customers use social marketing uh, to engage their partners, but more importantly, to engage through their partners uh, to really help make those partners thought leaders within their industry, uh, to position them as great solution experts and industry experts, especially when it gets down into specific verticals uh, that they represent. So first is just a, a brief case study on a customer of ours providing automated social syndication for the partners. And the main objective here is to provide the partners with an easy, scalable, automated approach to building brand awareness and thought leadership with a note that, Again, any solution that's being done through the partners has to be something that's flexible uh, because you have your very small VARs uh, that might really rely on the content and rely on uh, the copy and, of course, the tool for functionality. And at the same time, you also have uh, the DMRs and some large ISV partners, which, of course, you know, traditionally want to rely on their own branding and their own solution aspects. But, of course, they want your 
content. They want your examples, and they want to be able to provide an opportunity for customers and prospects to see themselves across both. And, you know, social marketing is a really easy way of doing this, and it's also a way of keeping the partner relevant. And the partner generally requires that, that content that's given to them for social marketing has to be relevant to their business. It's got to be relevant to not just your product, but, again, the way they sell it. And, again, that's where the flexibility comes in. And this is a, a part of a presentation we gave to a bunch of partners on behalf of a customer, and it gives the partner the opportunity to subscribe to the social streams that they're interested in syndicating, uh, providing them abilities to connect through LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, because they're very different types of medium, uh, of media, and of course you engage customers and prospects in different ways across each one, uh, different focus of course in different industries and verticals. Also giving the partner the opportunity to remove posts uh, that they don't want to send, uh, and of course the opportunity to add their own posts or even to modify some of the posts to make it much more relevant and specific to their market. Uh, those posts are published to the various social channels on behalf of the partner. Um, again, taking the mentality that uh, allowing a partner to opt in once and having these posts on their behalf but giving them visibility into what's being posted is a much better practice that we see than giving the partner just a copy in the content and asking them uh, to post on their own. Uh, and then it allows them to communicate, of course, directly to the people who interact with the post and be able to track very specifically who those key um, followers are, who the key influences are within that community. Okay. And some data uh, that we pulled here, is the key is to see all different types of media being engaged by the partners uh, and, of course, allowing the partners to, to see what's being posted on their behalf. Uh, I don't think social marketing is ever going to be viewed uh, as a key lead gen tactic. It's not going to be viewed as something that's going to, quote, unquote, deliver an ROI. But when you see that the aggregate of a partner base has over 200,000 followers uh, on Twitter, has well over uh, 150,000 followers on LinkedIn, there's a very large audience there. And, of course, that's the beauty of going through the partners and through the channel is to enable them to reach their own prospects, but, of course, you as the brand and as the vendor being able to expand and magnify your reach throughout um, a partner base and a customer base that typically you would not be able to penetrate on your own uh, without massive dollars. So uh, we see social marketing and social syndication as a very scalable very easy to turn on tactic uh, that we've seen customers have tremendous success with. Again, not success that you would see in, in a way of generating leads, but to see the amount of exposure, the amount of page views, the amount of interaction it generates uh, to, of course, keep that partner positioned as a brand expert and a thought leader uh, within their specific vertical. So I'm going to turn it back over to Laz to walk through part of the next topic. Laz, you there? Yeah, sorry about that, Mike. I was uh, having myself on mute. Yeah. No problem. Um, you know, the, the, the idea that the, uh, that the partner, you know, the first thing they do when they meet a customer contact after the meeting is that they reach out to them and they connect on LinkedIn, right? And if you look at the average salesperson and the partner, being able to mine that connection is really the key. And so this, I'm, I'm a firm believer in this social syndication. You know, in the next stage, the middle stage, we still see white papers and peer referrals being really important, but we see more tactics converging here. We see a, a lot of content marketing, and really what it points to is we're trying to enable the buyer. And when we're in, in trying to do so, one of the things I know you guys have had a lot of success with has been the idea of the Swint Syndicated webcast. How does that work, Mike? And if someone's on the line, how do they get started yeah. with something like this? Absolutely, Les. Thank you. Um, so webinars we found to be the most effective um, tactic of lead gener of qualified lead generation done through the channel. Um, and, of course, a webinar is not something that most partners are going to do on their own from the time to produce, the time to execute, and, of course, finding the brand expert and someone that uh, generally prospects and customers would come to, to hear speak. So the best practice that we've seen is, of course, the vendor running a webinar and allowing partners uh, to participate in that webinar to invite their own prospects. So those vendor-led webinars with the partners driving their attendance is the specific case study I'll use here. Uh, the objective, again, it's got to be something easy for the partners to join. 
Uh, and it also needs to be easy for the partner to promote the webinar because if they run the webinar and have three attendees, it's clearly not something that's going to work. The two key caveats here, of course, being number one, data security. The partner wants to make sure that if they invite their own people to a, a vendor-led webinar, that their data are protected and that their data are not shared to that vendor, which is something we've been able to help them with. Uh, and the second is that any attendee to that webinar, um, of course, comes back to the partner and that that, that lead is not lost uh, and sent into oblivion into the partner sales world, uh, where, of course, they would probably lose them. Now, the other key here is enabling the partners to drive registration and to drive demand for this tactic, um, for this event, uh, using a multitude of different tools. So from email, of course, sending out the initial email invitations, direct mail possibly, if you have a high-touch customer, uh, Google AdWords potentially, but probably more Google Display Ads, uh, and retargeting to follow that prospect, uh, and, of course, social marketing uh, to, to build the awareness that there is this event. Of course, they then have the webinar, uh, but more important sometimes even than just the event and getting people to the event is what's done after the event. And, you know, setting those webinar attendees into a nurture stream to, of course, accelerate the conversion uh, from a marketing lead into a sales opportunity, into a sales qualified lead. And we find, again, it's very important to provide those partners with an, an easy-to-use turnkey, you know, method of the email invitation that, of course, is branded on their behalf. Uh, the registration landing page where that data is kept segmented by partner so that the partner feels comfortable and confident inviting their own people uh, to a vendor webinar. Uh, of course, the confirmation to make sure they drive up attendance, uh, the reminder email, and, if, and last but not least, the post-event reports and then the post-event marketing uh, that would go out on behalf of that partner. And again, the partner needs to know that this is something for them. It's not a vendor product, it's not a vendor webinar. In this case, it's a partner webinar that they're joining. It's a partner webinar that they're participating in so that, again, they feel comfortable representing themselves to their prospects, okay? We also found that from a data standpoint that the webinar attendance, again, we talk about the most effective tool uh, to driving uh, leads from form submission into opportunity is webinars. We see upwards of 15, sometimes 20% of just registrants converting to sales qualified lead uh, as a result of just signing up for a webinar. It's not always important that they even attend the webinar. It's even more important um, that they just sign up for the webinar, and that is a really key sign, and it's a, it's a prospect or a customer raising their hand saying, I am very interested, so making sure that that prospect is spoken to immediately um, and passed to sales, of course, with the right tactics uh, from the sales team. And, Laz, I'm just going to jump into the, the uh, last example here as well, which out of the middle stage, of course, is more that late stage uh, prospect. And with the late stage prospect, you know, now we're, we're talking about more, you know, focus on, on the peer referrals and, and having uh, clear reports that, that walk through case studies and implementation examples so that there's real evidence that this is the right thing to do. And one thing that we wanted to exemplify here, something we've done with the customer, is incorporating a continual nurture process through the entire buyer's journey uh, with a key focus on sales enablement towards the end. And our opinion, and, and Laz can probably address this more towards the end, is that sales people can very often be your best marketers. And of course, they could also be your worst marketers. So it's important for vendors to provide their channel partners with not just the marketing campaigns, but the tools for those salespeople to use to, again, continue that nurture, continue that marketing process until there's finally a PO in place uh, and a closed order. So case study number three is a fully integrated multi-touch marketing campaign, again, with sales enablement. So combining targeted nurture streams with the sales enablement to keep the mind share of the prospect while also accelerating progress toward a sale. And we used an example here that said, uh, we've shown this to many of our own customers because it's probably one of the most effective uses of, of integrated marketing uh, that we've seen, and it's something very easy to replicate. So first, of course, is just a general email campaign that went out at the early stage of the buyer's journey, you know, landing page with information, but not just as the landing page a destination for the prospect to read about, in this case, FlexPod, but it's an, it's an opportunity for us to now tag that prospect with a retargeting cookie on behalf of that partner. So this happens automatically. Now, when that prospect goes and visits, for example, in this case, Computer World, uh, there could be banner ads and display ads in this case that will activate to now target that prospect as they visit other websites. And, and again, we find that this is a very scalable 
a uh, very automated way of keeping the product and keeping the information in front of the customer uh, as they progress through the journey. They, so now they, they might click on that banner ad. They're now brought to a, a FlexPod landing page. You know, and now they're, they're sent to a page where if they want more information, now it's a gated offer. So now there's an ability to download a white paper, which, again, once someone shows the, the willingness to part with their contact information, they're, of course, moving themselves further and further down that, um, that buyer's journey. So now we have their information. We know that they're probably an elevated interest level. So instead of just putting them in a generic director stream, we know that this prospect is interested in this product. We know that they're now exploring a more detailed form of, of content by looking at the white paper or the case study. So now instead of just entering them in a generic nurture stream, we're going to put them very clearly into a nurture stream knowing that information. So now they're more in that engaged buyer process. They're not yet a sales lead, but of course we're still going to have the display ads following them to keep FlexPod in their mind. I uh, think that that's a very key aspect here, but we're also going to invite them to a webinar. And like I said, webinars tend to be one of the highest conversion rates from prospect to sales qualified lead because it, it shows a tremendous level of interest and commitment uh, to the buying process. After the webinar, uh, of course, there, we now have a sales qualified lead, but now that we call them a sales qualified lead, they need to be entered into a sales nurture process. And here's where, you know, continual marketing needs to happen that, that is now sales focused. Like Laz said, it's now peer referrals. So different examples of customers in their uh, industry bracket or in their company size bracket, uh, implementation examples, financing offers, and things that really push that prospect toward becoming uh, an official sale uh, or at least, you know, part in the closing or opportunity process. And I put here, don't forget about sales because a lot of the channel partners we speak to tell us that their salespeople are among their top users uh, of the system. Uh, but very often the complaint that we hear is that the salespeople don't have enough sales enablement tools in the marketing library, um, and that's, again, a huge area of opportunity. Putting in call scripts uh, for the partner salespeople, uh, cheat sheets, which gives them comparisons on product details, infographics, which customers tend to devour and they're very shareable, uh, they become viral, uh, price and product comparisons. So, again, those channel salespeople, those partner salespeople are fully equipped to handle uh, the, the questions that come their way. Uh, financing offers, implementation case studies, and of course, again, anything else that a typical customer or prospect uh, might be asking toward the end of that sales journey. So to give this to a partner and to say, go set this up on your own, here are all the emails, here are all the landing pages, here's the webinar, that, that's too complicated for most partners. So the key is to make this turnkey. Um, and make it very simple so the partner can activate this or participate in this simply by almost subscribing to it. And again, all this hard work and all these details happen on their behalf afterwards. So I want to turn it back over to Laz um, to wrap up with the last few slides, and then we have a bunch of questions that have come in, uh, and we'll be able to target those towards the end. Great, Mike. Go, Laz. So let's, let's, just, uh, let's just share with everyone kind of this framework that we've been talking about. And again, the, the best thing you can do is align the, uh, the, the tactics and the programs to the buyer's journey. Realize that the beginning is going to be largely online, web-based, and then sales is going to interact, and we're going to need to equip them with the enablement tool that they're going to, and they're going to need to be successful. Um, what I really would like you guys to think about is not just the tactics, but the processes below them themselves. And that's something that we've tried to mention here a couple of times. So, Mike, if we kind of just animate this, you'll see that in the beginning when we're generating new business, right, sure, you use social media, you can use blogs, you can use testimonials. But think about a comprehensive social syndication program, something that gets the partner engaged and keeps them involved. Try to avoid these random acts uh, and these one-off efforts because really then you're going to de be dealing with a lot of the adoption and engagement issues. When we're looking to increase conversions, that means that now we need to make sure that sales can become more effective in their ability to move the buyer from the left to the right. Again, presentations, subject matter experts, executive briefings, all of these things are going to be important, but focus on a comprehensive sales enablement program that you can utilize, things like these webinars that um, you know, Structured Web has been so successful with. 
And then finally, when you're trying to retain those customers and grow that business and make sure that you don't get left out when they're in that decision-making process, don't think that you've lost everything here. Or, or on the other hand, don't think that you've got the game won. Make sure that you stay present in mind. Make sure that you've got a good nurturing program, you know, a, a passive nurturing program, which basically, you know, keeps the customer informed of any new developments that might spark interest, might keep them engaged. That's going to be really important. You know, I remember as a salesperson down the middle of this process, I would always say to myself, oh, the kid, the deal's in the bag. No need to worry, right? Well, while you're not worrying, your competitor's in there keeping that relationship going, and now that's happening over the web. So we just want to leave you with this framework to make sure that you know which are the right tactics and which are the right processes. And in terms of takeaways, just a few very simple things we want you guys to remember. The first one is that buyers are more knowledgeable, right? They're in control, folks, and you need to have as strong a digital relationship with that buyer, and it's just not sales by themselves. They need marketing's help. So now more than ever, marketing can step up and contribute to that pipeline by helping in those early stages and then in the middle and late stages. The other thing to do, and this is something that the folks from Structured Web have seen over and over, and then we see it with our clients, is that everybody's in a hurry to create marketing tactics. Everybody's in a hurry to create marketing programs and measure them. But very few times do we see these programs aligned to the buyer's journey to the personas involved in that journey. So make sure that you've got this alignment. Use the frameworks that we've shared here with you to become more effective. The other thing we want to just leave you with is think about it. It's not just one marketing activity that counts. It's a combination. And really what you want to do is help that partner tell a story. Help them tell their story. Right? And that's when you really start seeing these partners differentiate themselves and become successful. So as you're building these programs, think about, you know, combining it all to tell the right story on behalf of the partner. And the last thing is start now. What are you waiting for? Right? Think about it. There's somebody out there consuming content as we speak. And that's forming opinions. That's forming thought leadership. And what we really would like you folks to remember is that it counts way from the start, even when you don't even think that that partner is engaging with the customer. They are engaging. The customer is doing their shopping. And we want to make sure that we've capitalized that in the early stages. So with that, we've come to the conclusion of the uh, content of our presentation. I know we have some questions, Mike. Um, why don't we take some of those questions and see if anyone uh, – uh, wants to step up and ask the, I guess, so-called experts. Absolutely, Les. Thank you again. Uh, we do have a few questions that came in throughout and, and one that just came in uh, right now. Uh, the first is related to, um, again, how much content, or again, if you were to, to distribute tactics, so you have the early stage of the buyer's journey, the middle stage, and the late stage. The question is asking, what percentage would you allocate across the channel um, and does it differ by industry? I think we covered the percentages uh, in the yeah. slides, but does that significantly differ by industry? I think that's the more relevant part of the question here. Well, I, I think what you're going you're gonna to need to look at is your sales cycle, right? You're going to have to see, you know, how long is the sales cycle typically for your solutions? And if you have a long sales cycle, then you're going to want to even, the, the, even out those tactics into the middle and late stages. If, um, so, so really what it comes down to, if you have a product that sells for $100,000 and takes six months to sell, you're going to probably spend a lot more in the middle and in the late stages in terms of taxes than you are in the beginning, right? If you have a transactional product and you really need to get consideration, then you're going to spend more filling the top of the pipeline. And so really what I think you should do is in order to answer that question, you've got to look at your, uh, your ASP, you got to look at you know, your average settling price, you got to look at how long that sales cycle is, and then think about what's, what's the marketing requirement. Is the marketing requirement to fill the top of the funnel with as many deals as possible? If that's the case, then you focus on influence and early consideration. If the marketing requirement is to help sales overcome customer objections as they move through the process, then you're going to focus on the middle. And that goes for the late stage as well. When you're in that late stage, 
you know, and you're in a heavily competitive environment with a large ASP, then you're going to want to make sure that you've got all those tools to help them validate the purchase. So I would say two elements to look at is your ASP, your sales cycle, and then determine the marketing requirement, whether you need it at the top, the middle, at the end, and that's going to dictate what kind of marketing tactics and how much of them you're going to disperse into each three. Great. Thank you, Les. Um, next question I think I could take, it, it, it was about content. Uh, and the question reads, how much content needs to be generated or developed uh, for the partners to be able to support uh, being this flexible across the buyer's journey? And it took me a minute to think about the answer there, but again, given what we see across our customers, uh, content creation is something that uh, is time consuming. Of course, it requires budget, uh, but we also believe there are ways of really speeding that up. And I think when you try to take what you do on the direct side and do it across the partners, first you're thinking in the right direction to give the partners the same capabilities and sophistication that you do on the direct side. But I think partner marketing content generally has to be more transactional. It has to be almost a factory uh, to generate content. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be as pretty or as sophisticated or as, as detailed uh, as sometimes you would do on your brand marketing. And it's not to sacrifice, quote, unquote, the quality of marketing, but it's meant so that you could really easily churn uh, the different marketing and mass produce marketing uh, content at any time whether it be using templates for emails and landing pages or embedding content into partner sites that's very easy for them to turn on and turn off, uh, having a, a constant influx of social content that the partners can take advantage of. Uh, I think those are really the keys there. Um, and again, content does require time. Uh, there are many companies out there um, who can do it. Uh, but I think, again, much more important is to think of content from a modular standpoint. So, okay, how do I make this simple? Because, again, my job is not to necessarily develop perfect content for partners. It's really to develop the most amount of content for partners because your partners vary uh, drastically. And a uh, uh, question just came in, Laz, and I think this is perfect for you, and it actually mirrors two other questions that came in, which how does the buyer's journey uh, change based on partner type? And what are some of the implications? For example, uh, if there's a large partner with a uh, fully resourced marketing team uh, versus a small VAR that might have one or two people doing marketing, and those one or two people might also be doing sales and admin and finance and, you know, office cleaning and everything else. Well, I, I'll tell you what. It's, uh, it, it doesn't change as much by partner type because you, you still have the customer, and the customer is a content. Uh, I'm sorry, is a constant. Right? So you're always going to have the buyer behaving certain ways based on the solution that you're trying to sell. But clearly, uh, there's a big difference between a VAR, uh, you know, a small company with 20 employees and maybe one person running marketing uh, versus uh, somebody like, um, you know, uh, Insight or CDW. Um, the, the content will change. So if you think about the way that the buyer buys from these two different types of partners, it's going to be very hard for you to go to a company like CDW and say, look, here's a multi-touch program that we want you to run every time you run into this situation. Um, so the program will change based on the partner type. So there, there you have to be less prescriptive and really open-ended. So in order to let CDW tell their story. Remember, they're calling these customers up to sell them not just your product, but every other, you know, uh, infrastructure solution they need. And that goes across industries, right? If you think about financial services, you know, a uh, financial services advisor, they're looking out for that customer, and they may be re representing a, a multitude of carriers. Um, but the programs change, not so much based on the type of partner and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the buyer, but a combination of both. And so the programs that you deliver through a partner like CDW are going to be less prescriptive and they're going to be more customizable. The programs that you deliver to, uh, through a VAR, for example, that doesn't have the marketing program, those are going to be much more prescriptive. And you may even find that you're going to have to hire a concierge, is what we 
call it, somebody to act as a Sherpa to kind of guide that smaller partner through the marketing program itself. So I think that you have to just consider not just the partner type, but also the solution and the buyer, and then tailor those programs. Either some of them are going to be more customizable or less customizable based on those partner types. So I hope that that was uh, that was clear. I know that you know it's 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 like a Rubik's cube. You have to kind of right combination to deliver the program at the right time in the right manner for these different partners with varying capabilities. Very good. Well, Les, uh, I think we could probably continue on these topics for hours uh, because of the relevance uh, to the journey, uh, sorry, to marketing today. And, and uh, thank you, Megan, for that last-minute uh, question. I think that was a great question uh, for Laz. But um, we have to cut off here. Of course, if you have any follow-up questions, you could find Laz at laz.gonzalez, all Zs at seriousdecisions.com. Um, and, of course, myself, michael.cassette at structuredweb.com. Uh, this presentation will be available. Uh, after. Uh, this was also recorded. And of course, if there's anything we can do for you, channel marketing, channel sales related, structured web, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, and obviously, Sears Decisions has proven themselves as an amazing industry leader uh, from a consulting perspective, being able to really deliver actionable programs uh, that we've seen many of our own customers implement and have been truly impressed uh, with the level of detail. And Laz, thank you again for your time today and thank you for your many years of experience. Uh, helping our customers and future customers hopefully understand how B2B buyer's journey really extends within the channel. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Thanks for everyone joining. Take care. Thank you, Les. Everyone have a great rest of the day. Uh, and again, feel free to shoot over any questions after this uh, has completed. Thank you again for attending. Take care.